years, I've been asked more questions about strumming than about any other aspect of guitar playing. Truth is, there's a great deal more to the subject of strumming than really meets the eye. So people often underestimate the depth of the subject. But as with any complex subject, the trick is to first identify the underlying fundamentals and build a strong foundation with those upon which you can then layer the detail later. People get quite anxious, I find, to be told the right strumming pattern for a particular song. Now in this lesson, we're going to talk about a few underlying patterns that form the basis of 99% of all the strumming patterns used in popular music. And once you've got these few patterns nailed, I think you'll find the rest becomes nice and simple. Ultimately, I believe that playing rhythm is something you should be controlling with your right brain. In other words, it should become intuitive. However, sometimes to develop an intuitive skill, we need to first spend some time working the left brain. So let's start with a very logical exercise. Have a look at this pattern. First, Note that the strumming direction is shown by the arrows on the tab. And it's important to realise that the arrows that point upwards are used to show downstrokes. This stems from the fact that your view of the fretboard as you play the guitar is in fact upside down because you're looking at it like this. So that looks as if it's a, an upwards arrow. Hope that makes sense. So this is simply an instruction to strum across all six strings using a downstroke four times to the bar. As you strum, aim to keep your wrist and your forearm nice and relaxed and aim to get a nice even sound but with a slight emphasis on the first beat of each bar. One. Once you're happy with doing that, move right on to the next exercise. Here we have doubled the strum pattern by adding upstrokes between the downstrokes. So we now count each bar as one and two and three and four and one and two and three and four and one and two. Notice that we don't attempt to include all six strings in the upstroke. Just a, a little catch of the middle few strings, really. If you did, it would sound a bit too laboured. So, to make the upstrokes less significant, just kind of catch a couple of the strings there. It doesn't have to be precise, do it by ear rather than by trying to count strings. Once you're happy with that, practice shifting from one exercise to the other without losing any time. So you start with four bars of the basic four down strokes to the bar. Four bars 
of the 8-bit one with the upstrokes. Then back to 4 beats. 1, 2, 3, 4, 2, 2, 3, 4, 3, 2, 3, 4, 4, then double it up. too much about playing fast at this stage. What's important is evenness of sound and the flow of the thing. So this is better than this. second pattern, which we usually call 8-beat feel, is probably the most commonly used guitar strumming pattern or the most commonly used underlying guitar strumming pattern in modern guitar playing. So it's worth spending a bit of time on getting it nice and smooth. Once you do feel confident with it, move on to the next stage, which is where we double up the strumming yet again, like this. This is another very commonly used pattern that we refer to as 16-beat feel. We literally divide each beat into four strums. So each bar now has four lots of four beats, making up the 16-beat feel. Notice how the first strum of each beat is a long down stroke, the remaining three are short strokes played up, down, up. Now to demonstrate this clearly, I'm going to mute the guitar just by wrapping my left hand like a wet blanket around the strings here, just to kill the sound. It's a bit easier to hear exactly what's going on with this hand. So. We've got our four down strokes, our four main beats as long strokes. And then we fill in between with the little short strokes. So that's one bar. One, two, three. So those main beats are long and the fill-in beats are just little, almost little brush strokes on just a couple of strings in the middle there. The counting for this pattern is best vocalised as one E and a. 2E and 3E and 4E and and so on. This helps you get the pulse of the rhythm right. So that's 1E and 2E and 3E and 4E and 1E and 2E and 3E and 4E. 1E and 2E and 3E and 4E and 1E and 2E and 3E and 4E. Like a steam train. And so on. If you've not already spent hundreds of hours strumming the guitar, this pattern may not be easy to play.
The trick in this case is to cut back to the previous two exercises and alternate between them. Just one bar of the four beat, followed by one bar of the doubled up eight beat fill. So one, two, three, four, one and two and three and four. Then gradually make that go faster. to the 16 beat. So we'll go one, two, three, double it, one and two and three, double it again. on getting a smooth transition from the basic four to the bar through the eight beat feel and on up to the 16 beat feel. And once you feel you've got that down then I think the best thing is to practice that against a metronome to make sure that your timing is actually honest. If you don't own a metronome you can access one online from the toolbox to the right of the screen. Now, if you've never used a metronome before, I strongly suggest checking out the induction lesson in the Guitar Gym section of the site. That's lesson number 2.3. In that lesson, we go over some of the common problems people have um, when they're working with a metronome and help you overcome them. OK, so once you're happy basically using a metronome, uh, set it at a, a nice slow speed, say 60 beats. A minute. Then start just strumming one to the bar, uh, bigger pardon, one strum per click of the metronome. One, two, three, four, one. And use about four bars to settle into that. Two, and then double it. Keep that going for four bars. Then double it again. Start all over again, four bars of that. Double it. Double it again. And 
and so on. Now once you're comfortable going through the exercise at that slow speed of 60 beats per minute, I'd probably crank the metronome up about 10 or 12 beats. Um, so I've got it, my next uh, division on here is 72 beats per minute. So it's 12 beats more. And just go through the exercise again, exactly the same way. Two, three, four, one, two, three, four. I'm just going to do two bars of each one this time just to demonstrate one and two and three and four and one and two and double it again. Hold it. And so on. In this way you should be able to gradually work your way up by simple stages to settings of 160 beats per minute or more. As you approach this level you will definitely hit physical barriers that you won't be able to get past without improving your technique. For example if you use a plectrum to play the exact angle you hold the plectrum at will begin to become of critical importance. The plectrum is perpendicular to the strings, like this as opposed to that or that, then it offers too much resistance as you strum, and at high speed it'll just get caught up in the strings. So you need to close the angle between the plectrum and the strings like this, and reverse it as you come back up on the upstrokes, so that the plectrum tip is always lagging behind the motion of the hand. This is where that soft, relaxed wrist is so important. Notice this action. It's very much like, in slow motion, it's very much like painting a fence. It also helps to make the pick travel slightly diagonally across the strings, like this as opposed to like that. You'll find slightly less resistance in that direction than in that direction. It's also natural with the slope of the arm as well, so everything helps you keep relaxed and free-flowing. And finally, experiment with turning the pick round in your grip so that instead of using the pointed tip of a plectrum, you're using the rounded edge of it, like that, instead of like that. Again, offering as little resistance to the strings as possible. these little tips and tricks are aimed at softening the resistance of the pick to the strings. Less resistance equals less friction equals more speed and a smoother action and a better sound. Once you've got used to transitioning between these three particular patterns in this way, you'll be very well set up to cope with a wide range of songs that are all written in 4-4 four, four time. You may then like to go on and explore these patterns. This is the basic 3-4 pattern used for songs in waltz time as well as various folk influence tunes. Notice all the strokes are kept short in this one. So we count this one, two, three, one, two, three. It's a sort of um pa pa um pa pa um pa pa feeling. This can then be doubled like this. One, two, 
Double pattern in 3 4 time is not to be confused with this pattern in 6 8, which has the same number of strokes per bar but has a pulse of 2 instead of 3. So here's the doubled up 3 4 time. One, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one. And with the chords, it might sound. Something like that, very folky sounding. Eight sound is smoother. It's all down strokes. One, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five, six. And we usually count it almost as if it was in two time. One and a two and a two lots of three in other words. One and a two and a. With the chord. underlines the importance of learning the counting methods that I've uh, written in under each of these patterns on the examples we've shown in this video. Once you've really appreciated this difference between the 3-4 pattern and the 6-8 pattern, um, it's going to be relatively easy to move on to our final pattern that we're going to show in this video, the 12-8 pattern. You can see that one bar of 12-8 is pretty similar to two bars of 6-8. In practice, the only difference is the pulse of the music. 6-8 has its main pulse every two main beats. So we've got one and a two and a one and a two and a one and a two. And 12-8 has its main pulse every four main beats. So it's one and a two and a three and a four and a one and a two and a three and a four and a... Made more obvious if we put chord changes in. Uh, six eights. It's the favourite uh, timing of blues tunes. Okay, well that's covered the underlying form behind most of the patterns you're ever going to find yourself using. And some hours spent practising these basic patterns will help you build a very strong foundation to your strumming. In the next lesson, we'll look at some of the many technical tricks that are used to make these underlying patterns more interesting. So I look forward to seeing you then.